Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Viv Coleman. I'm, uh, I've been around this place for oh, I don't know, 15 years or something like that now, nearly. Uh, and I am a uh, trained pastor, but I'm in retirement mode, so I just get to do this kind of thing occasionally, but I'm really delighted to do it on this topic. Uh, in fact, when I saw the nine weeks, I said, I'm going to do that one because I knew it was the one I wanted to talk about, the rule of life. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. And thank you for the mysterious way that your word and your spirit work together in our lives to show us your heart and to form in us your character. In Jesus' name, amen. Just got to find which are the best glasses for this height. It's always different. Oh, it's the old ones. Depends how far I am. You know, I have to try it out in every different church. I do preach in a few other churches. When I was a kid, we lived in an older house with a kitchen that could hardly be described as fitted. The bins and cupboards had seen better days, and the old-fashioned four-mica bench sat under the windowsill. And now and again, a chilly Wellington wind would blow through the cracks. But we never really thought about those cracks until one day mum saw a cheeky green tendril peeping out between the sill and the sink bench. She assumed it was some sort of weed, but left it for a while. I guess she had a sneaky admiration for its determination. Over the months, we watched that shoot grow, taller and thicker, until it reached the top of the inside of the window and was sprouting flowers. It wasn't a weed at all, but a plucky frond of fuchsia growing outside that had found a way through a vent ventilation hole and up behind the kitchen sink. And the flowers grew so bountiful that someone told the papers, and so my sister Flora appeared in a photo in the Evening Post. Sorry, it's not very clear because that is about 55 years old, that piece of paper. <laughs> now, those of you who are gardeners will be able to explain. From the stony kitchen garden... This plant had found its way to a warm and sheltered spot and then onwards and upwards towards the moist air and dappled light of the kitchen. And once it was past the sink bench, then the sunlight fed further growth and the stems wound their way up via the window frame and the latch, that's one of those long ones that you hook on a peg, and achieved ceiling height. I guess you could say it's a parable of growth. It reminds us of the way that God has arranged much of this world with a trend towards growth. And that applies to the life of the soul as well. So provided we have something firm to use as a framework, our soul, like that fuchsia, can flourish. And that's why I've got these uh, garden scaffolds here. They're a symbol of what people in the ancient Christian monasteries called their rule of life. Going as far back as the 3rd century, they organised their daily life around an agreed plan consisting of work, sleep, prayer, and the study of scripture. It's called the Liturgy of the Hours, or you might have heard it called the Daily Office. And one of the most famous rules is the one Peter had for monks that he recruited in the 6th century. And ever since, this rule has shaped the hearts and lives of both monks and lay people with the goal that in all things God might be glorified. The rule acknowledges the impossibility of our becoming like Christ through effort alone. And the disciplines make space for us to attend to God's work in and through his people. You may know that today many churches publish their own daily office, and some of you might know that Rachel M. Emmett is a follower of the Benedictine rule. Now, don't be intimidated by the word rule. It's not about legalism, regulations, compulsion, or shoulds or have tos. It comes actually from the Greek for trellis. Now, a trellis is a tool that enables a plant or a grapevine to get off the ground and grow upward, becoming more fruitful and productive. So in the same way, a rule of life is like a trellis that helps us connect with God and become more fruitful 
spiritually. Now, the last time I preached on this theme here at Eastview, which is probably nine years ago, we used the big orange scaffold that's out the back. But I'm told that now we have different health and safety rules, so I wasn't allowed to use it today. But here's what it looked like at the end of that service. Some of you will have been here. It was part of a series we called Grow, God's Resources and Our Willpower. And that's why I brought these garden scaffolds so we can do something similar today. To remind us that having a framework helps us to grow straight and strong in our relationship with God and others. It's what Peter Scazzaro calls healthy spirituality. Now, some of you remember him from that series that we did back in 2012. Pete was a pastor in New York when he suffered a burnout experience. And it was on his journey back to wholeness that he discovered some ancient spiritual practices that are often called the contemplative life. We've been exploring many of these practices or disciplines over the last eight weeks using this book, the Spiritual Disciplines Handbook. This is the earlier version of it, whose author Adele Calhoun shows us dozens of practices that can can transform us, which is the subtitle, and she explains how they can nurture the 21st century soul, and that's what our sermons for the last several weeks have been at, about. I wonder if you can recall some of the ones we've covered. Would you like to just call out one or two of the things that we've covered? Oh, come on! <laughs> Journaling. Sabbath. Oh, I didn't hear Sabbath. I must have missed that one. <laughs> oh, come on. Forgiveness, yes. Gratitude, examine, Bible study, small groups, Ignatian gospel reading, lament, breath prayer, even the bespoke acrostics from Steve. <laughs> now, I've got a handout that lists the ones in the books, in the book, and maybe Grace will just pass them around. There's only about, I've printed off 70, so if you just take one per family, that should be enough. And don't take them if you're not into lists, because not everybody's wired that way. But I just thought it might be helpful for you to be reminded of some of the things that are in the book. And you can get the book on Kindle if you uh, don't want to um, have a hard copy. But today I want to, sorry? Oh, okay. Today I want us to think about having a conscious plan for our spiritual lives. Paul reminds us about the fact that the abundant life that God has in mind for us needs us to collaborate with his purpose in our lives. Uh, we just read that from uh, Romans 12.1. Give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. This is the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will know what is God's good and pleasing and perfect will. Or even better, in Ephesians 2, where he describes the balance between God's grace and our cooperation. Verses 8 and 9 say, You did not save yourselves, it was not the result of your own efforts, but rather a gift from God. That's grace. But then verse 10 because in Christ, God made us to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. So that's our cooperation. So it's kind of a teamwork. So those good works are the purpose of following a rule. Not to earn us brownie points or get us into heaven, but to just immerse us in God's love and to help us develop the character of a citizen of heaven. God's love initiates our response to him. We love him because he first loved us. And that's what Paul meant when he said, his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. A nun called Sister Elizabeth says that that joining is the meeting place between God's yes and our yes. I like that. Yeah, God's resources, but our choices. A conscious plan. 
However, the reality is that many of us find it hard to fit spiritual disciplines into our lives. Perhaps for some, especially parents, this got worse over COVID and lockdown. Although for others, it became more instinctive to pray and there, was less appoint there were less appointments and meetings to go to, fewer. This graphic from an old road safety ad illustrates often what our life is like, our crammed schedules, our endless lists, demanding jobs and families, constant noise, information bombardment and anxieties, and we just end up on autopilot a lot of the time. Yet we have to admit that there are certain routines that most of us use to manage our lives. Our morning one might be get up, feed the cat, have a shower, eat breakfast, brush teeth and get dressed in some order. People do it in different orders. The pattern might be different for everyone, but I think all of us would have a structure that makes our morning rule. So what about a structural plan for our spiritual life? Now, that's often more unconscious, but it is often there. It's often a rule that we've learnt from our parents, our teachers, our ministers, or perhaps it developed in reaction to one of those influences. A typical pattern for us might include church on Sundays, small group midweek, serving in a ministry, and praying before we go to sleep. However, Pete Scazzaro suggests that these practices are just not enough to keep us afloat in the ocean of the 21st century. The currents are too strong, he says, and we'll be swept away if we don't have a strong anchor, which is his metaphor for a rule of life. We talk about prayer, he says, but we pray erratically. We honour the Bible, but we rely on a very small a group of familiar passages to guide us. And our family life might be no better or no different from the unchurched home next door. And we still rank people on their education, wealth, beauty and popularity rather than their character. This quote from Dallas Willard hang over my desk up hung over my desk upstairs for several years. It says, if we do not make formation in Christ the priority, then we're just going to keep on producing Christians that are indistingu indistinguishable in their character from non-Christians. I mucked that up, so I'll read it again. If we do not make formation in Christ the priority, then we're just going to keep on producing Christians who are indistinguishable in their character from many non-Christians. So I'd like to suggest that nurturing a deep, and growing spirituality in our culture today requires a thoughtful, conscious, intentional plan, what the ancients call a rule. So what does the Bible have to say about this? Well, St. Benedict didn't invent the idea of a rule for loving, living, although he might have got the idea of the ringing of bells from the Roman Forum. But long before the rise of the Roman Empire, the Hebrews had a wealth of spiritual practices that helped them remember God and his covenant. You think about it. Daily prayers, weekly Sabbaths, annual feasts and rituals of forgiveness, even jubilee years. Remember from Deuteronomy 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And keep these words that I'm commanding you in your heart. Recite them to, the ch to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away and when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorpost of your house. That sounds like a framework, a structure. And you might remember that Daniel too followed a framework, which was to keep eating his Hebrew vegetable diet rather than buying into the luxury one of the Babylonians. And of course, Jesus had patterns of regularly seeking out solitude with God, as well as attending synagogue every week. I want to do a reading from Luke uh, to look at our first century Christians, the ones who lived in Jerusalem, 
because I think that they very quickly developed a kind of agreed rule. And here it is in the message translation. About 3,000 were baptized and committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. The believers lived in a wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Every meal a celebration, exuberant and joyful, as they praised God. And people in general liked what they saw, and every day their number grew as God added to those who were being saved. So did you notice that the message describes this pattern as their daily discipline? St. Benedict would say it was a rule, but in the sense of a tool, a trellis, a scaffold, not a rod for our backs. A rule of life very simply is an intentional, conscious plan to keep, to keep God at the centre. And its starting point is love, a desire to be with God and to love him. What I was asking Leone about was we actually sang some words about show me how to love as you love today. And both those songs we just sang were very appropriate. God's resources and our willpower. God's yes and our yes. So keep that in mind as we explore ways to say your own yes to God. To have your own personal rule of life. A unique individualized combination of spiritual practices to provide structure and direction to help us remember God as the source of everything. Having a rule deepens our relationship with God. It gives us ways to open our eyes, our ears and our hearts and it helps us to understand and manage our own lives in ways that reflect Christ's character. Of course, we have to admit that God made each of us unique and different. So the goal of a spiritual discipline, notice that it includes the word disciple, the goal is always the same, for us to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. But how we get there will vary enormously, depending on our personality, gift mix, temperament, geographic location, and particular calling from God. Think of the new Christians that we've seen get baptised here over the last few years. What a rich mixture. Just, that's just a photo of a few baptisms that I just was able to pick up off my computer. But just to say, here are people who have come from very different backgrounds, that sometimes another, the other side of the world, and God has had to work in different ways with each of them to help them to come to know what following Christ means. They have needed different emphases because of the different seasons and phases of their lives, just as those who have been on the journey a bit longer do as well. Working it out takes self-awareness, self-forgiveness, and a good deal of trial and error. We need to notice, for example, what draws me closer to God? What drives me away from him? Peter Scazzaro says that his own rule is a constantly changing pattern, one he doesn't even write down because he knows that if he does that, it will send him into a frenzy of perfectionism and shoulds and have tos rather than the want tos of love. His wife, Jerry, does write hers down. And has, she has a little pattern and ticks them off as she does them. So give yourself time to find out what works best for you. Start with just one or two elements, experimenting with time and place and rhythm. I hope that over these last weeks, you have been thinking about what habits would be a good fit for you. And today I want to nudge you into committing to something new in your particular rule. Now, if you're one of the people who likes to write down their plan, you could start with considering some of the headings from our Acts reading. The Apostles' teaching, shared worship, breaking bread, prayers, eating together, pooling resources. Or, if you're a Stephen Covey fan, you might think of the sharpening the saw headings, physical, mental, spiritual and social. Just make sure you've got a spiritual practice of something that draws you closer to God in each of those areas. And then, of course, we've been using 
the typology from Adele Calhoun, the letters W-O-R-S-H-I-P, which all stood for a different aspect of spiritual practice. Whatever paradigm you use, or even if you use none, the, the intent is the same, to help you think consciously about how God wants you to nurture your soul and to think about what scaffolding or trellis will help you to develop a more mature, authentic spirituality. In other words, I mean to say yes to God's yes. I do want to suggest a really simple paradigm that I just discovered this week. I've actually had this book for about 10 years, but I had only given its descriptions of folk living in their own form of the monastic life today a once over lightly. This is about people who intentionally seek new ways to have balance in their lives, to reconnect with neighbours, and to live in harmony with the earth. And the author describes experiments with community life based on a simple rule of practices that help its members say yes to God. But until this week, I hadn't actually picked up what the title meant. Cave Refectory Road, Monastic Rhythms for Contemporary Living. Now, I think I actually thought it was an address, a road called Cave Refectory Road. But it's not. Oh, incidentally, for those of you who are expecting my customary three points, here they are, but very, very briefly, you will have to work out the application yourself. Cave Refectory Road. The cave is the place of stillness, of prayer, of withdrawal that enabled the monks to engage with the mystery of God. The refectory was the dining room where the monks practiced hospitality and community that created life and hope. And the road, well, many of the friars went round travelling and meeting people's needs in a kind of social service or public life approach to community. So cave, refectory, road. And Jesus engaged with all three. He had times of stillness and solitude. He engaged with others over shared meals. And he had roadside encounters with those who needed to hear good news. So, how do we practice the spiritual life in these ways? And this is just a suggestion, just something to get you thinking. I'd like to suggest that CAVE is about your personal spiritual practices, your private and prayerful time with God, steeping yourself in Bible, prayer, art, poetry, or for many of us, music. You could say it's looking inward. Refectory is the faith community. Practices that look around you at who God has placed in your life. It might be your family, with your family devotions. It might be your home group. It might be a peer group from work. Or it might be a mentoring relationship that you've set up for a season. And then the road... That's the outward look. The people you encounter beyond your family and work. It might be a stranger you meet on a bus or a parent you get talking to at school. It might be a place of serving, the homework club, an environmental group, a service club, a special hobby. These are all places where spiritual conversations can occur. And you invite the spirit to use you, the body of Christ incarnate in you. So I guess what I want to ask today is, can you commit to a new experiment or practice in one of these areas? And I just know from my own experience that the old suggestion of doing it for 21 days is a pretty good marker. Whatever you choose, it means being intentional. Remember Romans 12 that we had at, at the beginning. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. 
We've mentioned heaps of hospitalities, and I found the signs from the old 2012 service that I kept. Some of these things you might already be doing. If you find it helpful, keep it in your rule. If not, try something different. And don't be too ambitious. A little change can make a difference over time. For the last 10 years, I've been having dental work done, and I'm amazed at how much my teeth moved over the five years I had to wear braces. It didn't hurt most of the time. It wasn't even noticeable. But with that constant, subtle pressure, things were moving and changing. Now, your rule can be like that too. Find a way that suits your temperament. This book, Cabra Victory Road, says that spiritual practices are like jazz music. We might start with learning a tune from the Desert Fathers or from St. Benedict, but then we enjoy the freedom to improvise and to make our own music. Let me finish the talky bit with a paragraph from Adele Calhoun, which basically summarises everything I've said. Rules keep our lives from devolving into unintended chaos. They aren't a burdensome list of do's and don'ts, enumerating everything you might do in a day. Life-giving rules are a brief and realistic scaffold of disciplines that support your heart's desire to grow in loving God and others. A rule honours your limits and your God-given longings. It must be written for who you are, not for who you aren't. It must, be, it must address your world, your sphere of influence, your fears, your relationships. It takes into account where you need to stretch and change as, as well as where you are tired and need balance. Don't be afraid to experiment with a rule because it can easily be changed and revised, but it should not be fickle. Allow yourself to settle into the rule before it has, so that it has time to shape your life. Ultimately, a rule will help you to love God more. And that is my prayer for all of us. In a moment, we're going to take a few minutes just to consider how we might respond. How we might say yes to God. And during that time, some of you might like to come and get one of these leaves and write on it something just between you and God that you're committing to. And I'd, I'd hope that we could cover this, these scaffolds with uh, lots of leaves. They only need one word on them and nobody's going to know who wrote it. Uh, and if we run out, I've got some uh, sticky notes there as well. And on the handout, there are some resources that you could look at if you want to finish, uh, if you want to think more about this at home. There's heaps of resources online and in print, and Nicola reminds me that there are copies of Adele Calhoun's book in the library. Can we just pray before we play that music? Loving God, you can do amazing things with humble, willing human servants. We come again to offer you our lives as a living sacrifice. Help us not to copy the ways of the world, but to submit ourselves to your spirit to be formed in the character of your son, Jesus Christ. And help us as we take a few minutes just to pray and to consider to hear your voice into our own context and to discover there's something new we might do to say yes to you. Amen.